second uh, talk for the inaugural speaker series for the Islam and the Humanities Working Group. I am Maite Green Mercado, Associate Professor of History and a member of the Islam and the Humanities Working Group. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Alia Khan, Associate Professor of English and Afro-American and African Studies, and the newest director of the Global Islamic Studies Center at the International Institute at the University of Michigan. Dr. Khan specializes in post-colonial Caribbean literature and the contemporary literature of the Muslim and Islamic worlds, with a particular focus on the intersections of race, gender, and Islam in the hemispheric Americas, including immigrant communities in North America. We are thrilled to host Dr. Khan today, whose work speaks so intimately to the inaugural theme of the Islam and the Humanities Working Group, which this year is Islamic Matters in Africa and the Colonial Atlantic. She will be speaking to us on her recently published book, Far From Mecca, Globalizing the Muslim Caribbean, published by Rutgers University Press in 2020 and the University of uh, the West Indies Press in 2021. The book garnered the 2018-2019 American Comparative Literature Association Helen Tartar First Book Subvention Award. Dr. Khan is a member of the editorial board of Bloomsbury Critical uh, Guides in Comic Studies, an advisory board member of the Journal of the Study of Indentorship and its Legacies, a longstanding member of the advisory board of the University of Michigan Arab and Muslim American Studies program in the Department of American Culture and a fellow of the University of uh, Michigan Center for World Performance Studies. Um, I want uh, you all to uh, hear the brilliance of Professor Khan. So without further ado, welcome Professor Aliyah Khan. Thank you for that kind introduction, Maite. Let me share my screen with all of you. All right, I'd first like to thank Professor Alex Dika Segerman, Professor Maite Green Mercado, and the Rutgers Islam, the Humanities, and the Human Working Group for inviting me to speak on their theme this year, Islamic Matters in Africa and the Colonial Atlantic. This talk is based, as Maite said, on my recently published book, Far From Mecca, Globalizing the Muslim Caribbean, on the history, literature, politics, and music of the Black and South Asian Indian Muslim Caribbean. I'll speak today for about 35 minutes, and then we'll have time for Q&A. So here's where we're focusing on geographically. I always like to start with a map because the people who come to these kinds of talks are very diverse and from different um, scholarly backgrounds. The Caribbean islands of Jamaica and Trinidad and the South American country of Diana, which is part of the Anglophone Caribbean community, by virtue of the fact that it was colonized by the British. Demographically, politically, culturally, and especially linguistically, Guyana has much more in common with the English-speaking Caribbean islands than with its Latin American geographic neighbors. For example, the populations of Trinidad and Guyana are almost evenly split between the descendants of the majority who work the sugarcane plantations first enslaved Africans, and then secondly, 19th and early 20th century indentured laborers from India. Other ethnic groups, including comparatively disenfranchised indigenous people in Guyana, form much smaller minorities. In the Caribbean, Islam is historically considered to be a religion of the Indo-Caribbean descendants of those indentured laborers who went to the Caribbean Indian indentured laborers who went to the Caribbean between 1838 and 1917. Something like 10% of indentured Indians may have been Muslim. The rest were mostly Hindu. But there is also a significant history of African Islam in the region. I'll begin this talk by noting some Muslim history in the Caribbean, including the multi-ethnic and multi-religious participation in the 19th century Muslim colonial festival of Taja or Jose in Guyana and Trinidad. Then 
I will discuss the Islamic writings of two West African men enslaved in Jamaica in the early 1800s, Muhammad Kaba Sarhanu of Ivory Coast and Abu Bakr al Siddiq of Timbuktu, as well as the Sufi influenced religious poetry of Abdurrahman Slade Hopkinson in 20th century Guyana. I'm interested in establishing a genealogy of Afro Caribbean Muslim literature. So I will argue that these men's literary works are linked across a transnational migratory century and a half by a concern with Sufi Muslim ideas of the hidden, batin, and other political religious principles of West African Islam. Though Hopkinson is also concerned with, as a post-colonial poet, questions of how the landscape of Guyana, the hinterlands, differs from that of the island Caribbean and what that means for multi-ethnic post-colonial identity. So how many Muslims are there and were there in the Caribbean? Post-independence from England in 1970, the number of Muslims in Guyana peaked at 9.1% and in Trinidad at 6.2% of the population. These numbers have decreased, decreased as a result of migration to England and North America. In the early 2000s, Muslims were 13.5% of Surinamese, that includes Javanese and Indian Muslims, and a statistically negligible 0.04% of Jamaicans. You can see from this 1968 Diana newspaper ad that Caribbean and South American pilgrims from countries like Trinidad, Guyana, Suriname, and Barbados were already traveling together to the Hajj and had a sense of themselves as one regional branch of the Ummah, the worldwide Muslim community. Muslims are certainly a religious minority in the Caribbean, but they are not an invisible one. On July 27, 1990, for example, 114 armed members of the Muslim organization, the Jamaat al-Muslimin, led by Imam Yassin Abu Bakr, seized control of the government and national television station of Trinidad and held parliament hostage in an attempted coup that lasted six days before their surrender to the army and police. In the book, I argue that this event was something regionally akin to the US's 9-11 moment in the way that it altered perceptions of Muslims in Caribbean public discourse. Imam Abu Bakr actually passed away in Trinidad three days ago at the age of 80, but I was fortunate to be able to interview him for the book, since by virtue of this Jamaat al muslimin 1990 coup, he became the larger than life original Caribbean Muslim terrorist, according to both Trinidadian and US government authorities. It's also important to note that Abu Bakr like the majority of the members of the Jamaat al muslimin was a Black Muslim revert with ties to Muammar Gaddafi's non-aligned Libya and Black Muslim movements in the United States. And also that the 1990 coup, as I've mentioned, is the moment when the, Afro the Anglophone Caribbean realized that some Afro-Caribbean people, and not just Indo-Caribbeans, were also Muslim. That's the more or less contemporary era. But how many enslaved Muslims, African Muslims, were there in the Americas? That story actually begins not with the transatlantic slave trade, but with the post-Reconquista North African and Iberian Moriscos, or Moors, who accompanied Spanish and Portuguese explorers on voyages of discovery in the 15th and 16th centuries. The Moriscos, like Muslim African victims of the transatlantic slave trade in the Americas, did not leave direct Muslim descendants. The most well-known Morisco on the ill-fated 1527 Narvaez Spanish expedition to colonize Florida was the enslaved Moroccan Mustafa al Zamori, also known as Mustafa Azimori, Esteban Dorantes, and Estebanico, as you can see here from the Mex a Mexican film in 1991. He was allegedly eventually killed by Zuni or Hawiku indigenous people in present day New Mexico. Laila Lalami fictionalizes Estebanico's story in her novel, The Moor's Last Sigh from 2014. Historians Michael Gomez and Edward Curtis and Sylvian Diouf suggest that there may have been tens of thousands or 10% of enslaved Africans in the Americas who were Muslim. <laughs> 
As difficult as it is to estimate the overall numbers of Africans who embarked upon slave ships and did or did not survive the Middle Passage, it is impossible to know how many enslaved Africans may have been Muslim. What we do know though, is that although there were a continental religious minority, there were Muslims of many ethnicities and tribal affiliations living in the West African, Senegambian and Guinean slave trading regions. In addition, the recorded names of enslaved persons on Caribbean plantations included Muslim names like Muhammad, Abu Barika, Hamadi, Malik, Muhammadou, Abduli, Salim, Muhammadou, and Mamadou. You'll note that none of these names are female. Women are mostly, unfortunately, invisible in the literary archive of enslaved African Muslims in the Americas. There are also records of literate male African Muslims being given preferential jobs like driver and bookkeeper on Caribbean and US plantations, not just because they could read and write, but because plantation owners identified them as racially superior to Central and other Africans, classifying them as Moorish in the tradition of Shakespeare's Othello, rather than as Black Africans. That Moorish racialization of enslaved Muslims is one underexplored facet of how Islam has always been racialized in the Americas, which is an overarching argument of my book. I also discuss in the book that the clearest example of the enslaved African Muslim legacy in the Anglophone Caribbean is that in Guyana, Muslims of every race are now somewhat derogatorily referred to as Fulaman, from the West African tribal name Fula or Fulani. Similarly, in Trinidad, Muslims are generically called Mandingas or Madingas after Mande West African people who were presumably Muslim and enslaved in Trinidad. There are also stories of early Indian Muslim indentured laborers in the 19th century encountering African Muslims and their Arabic Qurans in the Caribbean. Many enslaved African Muslims were Sufis. Sufism is the so-called mystical branch of Islam, of the whirling dervishes and the Persian poets Jalaluddin Rumi and Omar Khayyam. In the form of Tariqa brotherhoods, Sufism has held strong in West Africa from the 15th century onwards, even when falling out of favor elsewhere. Literary West African Islam reached a height in the 15th and 16th centuries, with 150 to 180 predominantly Sunni Quranic schools in Timbuktu international engagement with Sunni Egyptian scholars and travel to the Saudi Arabia to the Arabian Hajj, not Saudi. Sufism arrived in Timbuktu from the North African Maghreb region in the 15th century. In the United States, there were a number of literate enslaved Mus African Muslims who wrote autobiographies and religious documents. Three of the most well-known of these documents are the 19th century Bilali Muhammad document from Sapello Island, Georgia, which is an Islamic treatise. The 1831 autobiography of Senegambian Fula scholar Omar Ibn Said, who was known to the US public as the Arabian Prince. And thirdly, the, autobiogra the autobiography of Ayuba Suleiman Diallo, seen here. Diallo was a Fula Muslim of the Maliki Muslim school. He was born in Bundu, Senegal in 1701, then enslaved in Maryland, and then he was sent to and freed in England. He was one of very few Africans who were able to return home to Africa, first to Gambia and then to Senegal. How could he make his way home when most others could not? Diallo distinguished himself in the same way that some other enslaved African Muslims did in the United States and in the Caribbean. As an upper-class Fula Muslim, he could read and write in Arabic, and he could communicate his identity and religion to sympathetic whites. The story goes that Diallo was at first reluctant here to be painted because of religious reasons, then he insisted that he be painted only wearing his African clothes. He had to describe these clothes to the English painter who had never seen them. The red bound Quran hanging around his neck, as I, as I say here, is one of three that he wrote from memory. Here are pages from writings by Omar Ibn Said and the Islamic manual, the Bilali Muhammad document in the United States. In addition to the 1831 Arabic autobiography, The Life of Omar Ibn Said, written by himself, Ibn Said left 14 short manuscripts, 
As is suggested here, he, like the African Jamaican Muslims we'll discuss later, had a complex relationship with forced or pressured conversion to Christianity. Some scholars say he did convert to Christianity, some say he didn't. The Bilali Muhammad document was thought to be a diary or autobiography until translated. It's a religious Islamic text. It can be difficult to translate these documents because they are sometimes written not in Arabic per se, but in Ajami, a mix of Arabic and West African languages like Wolof, rendered, rendered into Arabic script. As a side note, I also just learned that the much heralded 1764 English language Quran owned by Thomas Jefferson is on display at the current Dubai Expo, which just opened in October. This year's iteration, of course, of the International Expos of Industry that began in London in 1851. The Quran is on display with a map of Mecca that originally came with it when Thomas Jefferson bought it in London. They are on display at the Dubai Expo in the United States Pavilion, alongside a SpaceX rocket and a NASA moon rock. According to the Library of Congress, which sent the Jefferson Quran abroad for the first time since Jefferson owned it, the Quran, which will be shown for the first three months of the expo, will be the, quote, first object on display after guests emerge from a sound and light experience that showcases the U.S. founding principles, particularly its innovations. Jefferson and the Quran are the first example of those goals. Presumably, the American quote unquote innovative founding principles that the Quran is supposed to represent are plurality and religious tolerance. Thomas, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson's approach to religious plurality inclusive of the Muslim world could certainly be said to include this Quran, as well as his geopolitical interest in North Africa, with the Kingdom of Morocco being the first country to recognize American independence in 1777, and Jefferson hosting a Tunisian envoy at the White House for Ramadan during the Barbary War in 1805. But the Library of Congress also had the euphemistic gall to say that Jefferson, due to his large holdings of enslaved Africans, quote, may well have had firsthand experiences with members of the faith. Apparently, firsthand experience with Muslims and African Muslims involves enslaving them. The same Library of Congress holds both the Thomas Jefferson Quran and most of the manuscripts of Omar ibn Said, who was an actual Muslim and an enslaved African in the US. One wonders why the Library of Congress did not send Ibn Said's manuscript instead to Dubai to represent American Muslim history and Islamic literacy and plurality in the United States. We probably know the answers to that question. There are far fewer texts written by African Muslims in the Caribbean. One is from 1817 Trinidad by Muhammad Aishatu, a Hausa and Imam from Gobir in what is now Nigeria. He was a soldier from the 3rd West Indian Regiment, which consisted of men who after 1807 had been pulled off of slave ships and freed if they agreed to fight for the British in the Napoleonic Wars. David Trotman and Paul Lovejoy write that a significant minority of the soldiers in the regiments were Muslims, particularly as many came from ships traveling from the heavily Muslim Bight of Benin in the Gulf of Guinea. Enslaved African Muslims in the Americas left literature and cultural traces, but as I've mentioned, their descendants were not directly Muslim. Imagine the impossibility of generationally maintaining Islam and the all important literary and oral study of the Quran under conditions of chattel slavery. But as I previously noted regarding Imam Abu Bakr and the Trinidadian Jamaat al Muslimin, as a result of conversion or reversion, which went hand in hand with 20th century black nationalists and pan-African politics, there are several continuous generations of Muslims of African descent in the Caribbean and North America now. To switch contextual gears for a moment, the most historically visible instantiation and metonym of Caribbean Islam is the Shia Muslim festival of Muharram that became Taja or Tazia in Guyana and Husse in Trinidad and Jamaica during the 1838 to 1917 period of Indian indentureship following the abolition of slavery in the British West Indies. This festival, which commemorates the early Islamic battle of Karbala and martyrdom 
central to the, religi the religious schism between Sunni and Shia Islam, was also celebrated in Suriname. Taja or Husse was a multi-day religious celebration featuring a public procession of large and small model tombs. Those are the Tajas that you can see here in what looks like a mosque. A red model of the crescent moon and a green model of the moon representing the martyred brothers Hussein and Hassan respectively. And then flags, singing, dancing, and drumming. In the earlier days of the festival, there was also stick fighting known as gatakar and fire dancing or fire pass. The Taja model tombs are carried toward a mythic extranational Karbala, the Iraqi city where Hussein was martyred in an early Islamic battle. The Tajas are usually taken into the sea to be submerged, a gesture sometimes criticized in the Caribbean as too Hindu. Taja or Hussein has Shia Muslim roots and is usually associated with Indians. But the illustrative point I want to make here is that in the colonial period, the festival attracted both Muslim and Hindu, as well as African celebrant, celebrants and participants, and that is partly why the British colonial government feared it and attempted to stamp it out. In 19th century Trinidad, Afro-Trinidadians found Jose's carnivalesque street festival aspect familiar, and they began to take part in the procession as drummers for which they were paid in rum or cash. They sometimes carried the tajas or the model tombs. The working class Afro-Caribbean transition from party goer to participant was even more pronounced in British Guyana, where Afro-Guyanese also began as festival porters and drummers, but then started up their own parallel Good Friday festival of Black Taja. Taja was suppressed in British Guyana with Colonial Ordinance Number no. 16 of 1869, which stipulated that no Taja processions will be entered, will be permitted to enter the precincts either of the city of Georgetown, the capital, or of the town of New Amsterdam. The ordinance imposed a host of other restrictions on pain of imprisonment and hard labor. In Trinidad, in an 1884 event that came to be known as the Maharam Massacre, police read the Riot Act to Jose processions entering the town of Fernando in defiance of Trin Trinidad's similar 1882 government ordinance limiting the festival. The colonial police then opened fire on a defiant but unarmed multiracial crowd killing 16 and wounding scores more. These killings, not Trinidad's 1882 law, which was less restrictive than British Guyana's, were what signaled the decline of the festival and Afro-Trinidadian participation in it. What remained of Jose in early 20th century Trinidad and Guyana after colonial restrictions and the uncompromising hostility directed toward the festival by Presbyterian missionaries then fell out of favor with mainstream Sunni Muslims who looked down on the festival's Shia origins on, and also looked down on its irreligious festive atmosphere and the alleged idolatry of the Taziadari or the model tomb procession. The festival survives in St. James and Cedros in Trinidad and has undergone an inter-ethnic 20th century revival there and to an extent in Jamaica. At its colonial height, says Frank Karam, Taja or Jose was an intriguingly flexible arena for interracial and interreligious participation, providing a Muslim avenue for cultural exchange between Black and Indian residents of Guyana and Trinidad, who were usually pitted against each other in the colonial labor economy. I'm making this point to show that the equating of race with religion in Guyana and the Caribbean is partly a product of the British colonial attempts to suppress creolization and religious syncretism. In the rest of this talk, I'll focus on the transatlantic migratory Afro-Caribbean Islam, on the autobiographical religious texts of two enslaved West Africans in Jamaica, and as I previously mentioned, on the Guyanese poetry of Abdurrahman Slade Hopkinson. My interest, again, is in establishing a lineage of Afro-Caribbean Muslim literature, partly in service of disproving the notion that Afro-Caribbean Islam begins simply with conversions in the 20th century. Our first Jamaican author, Muhammad Kaba Sarhanugu, alias Dick, alias Robert Pert, alias Robert Tuffet, alias Muhammad Kaba, alias the Mohammedan, a native of Buka in Northern Côte d'Ivoire or Ivory Coast, 
arrived in Jamaica enslaved in 1777 at the age of about 21. He died in 1845, still in bondage in Jamaica. Kaba wrote an Arabic autobiographical and theological treatise around 1820. The manuscript is untitled, but translators Paul Lovejoy and Yassine Dadi Adun have dubbed it the Kitab al-Salat, or the Book on Praying. His name was Muhammad Kaba Sarhanugu. The patronymic Kaba suggests that he was likely a Senegambian Mande or Mandinka of the Jakanke merchant and clerical diaspora. His immediate clan, the Saganuru, were an important clerical family, noted for teaching the Islamic sciences and associated with the tradition of Sufi scholarship, founded by the Sheikh Salim al-Suwari in the late 15th century. Ivor Wilts and other historians describe the Sufi Muslim West African Suwarian tradition as a branch of the larger Qadiriya Sufi Brotherhood that had a learned pacifist and quietist orientation. After, after the 17th century decline of the Muslim-led Mali Empire, Kaba's people, the Suwari, embraced an ideology of pluralism, coexistence, and assimilation for Muslims living in non-Muslim lands. There is no way of knowing whether Kaba's understanding of his accommodationist nat natal Islamic tradition allowed him to convert to Christianity in Jamaica. He was baptized as a Moravian in 1813, but the interesting thing is he wrote the Islamic Kitab after that. Kaba reported mystic prophesying dreams, which is a Sufi phenomenon, that drove his Christian conversion. Perhaps he then felt that Allah endorsed his taqiyya, or prudence, which is an Islamic theological and jurisprudential concept permitting hiding one's religion if there is a threat to one's life, regardless of what you may have heard that Turkey is in current US discourse. In considering Kaba's conversion to Christianity and theorizing his nonetheless continued adherence to Islam, I emphasize first that the Kitab, which is essentially an autobiographical manual on practicing Islam, was written at least seven years after his Christian baptism. Second, that Kaba was a Suwarian Qadri West African Muslim from a tradition revolving around accommodation in a non-Muslim society. And the third, his own words suggest that he was grieved by the material and religious circumstances in which he found himself. You can see, by the way, that this text begins with the Basmalah, right? Basmalah Rahman Rahim, which would certainly suggest that it's at least related to Islam. Kaba addresses his manuscript in the beginning to the Jamaatul Muslimina wal Muslimat. That is, he called on the Muslim community of men and women while speaking as one of them. He concludes part one of his autobiography with a wrenching sentiment. The book is finished. The last day of writing by the hands of the Abd is Friday. The Jews refer to the name of the one who owns the writing as Muhammad Kaba Sakunuku. I am Muhammad Kaba Sakunuku. I do not know anything. Of, I do not know anything of the knowledge of Al Bahr. My memory is corrupted. I am not finding science. I have started asking for pardon day and night. I ask for pardon for every situation. Abd is usually translated as slave or servant, including in the sense of Islamic submission to Allah. It and its derivative Abid can also be a racist anti-Black slur in the Arabic speaking world. Kaba implies that he is a slave within by choice to God and without by force to whites in Jamaica. Al-Bahar also has a double meaning. It literally means sea, but refers specifically to any man of science or one who displays a wide range of knowledge. When Kaba says that he does not know anything of the knowledge of Al-Bahar, it is not because he never did, but because after decades of enslavement, his memory is corrupted and he is, as he says, not finding science. His knowledge of the Sufi Suwari Qadriya West African Muslim way, his birthright, has become fragmented, but he nonetheless attempts to set it on paper for posterity. Of whom is he asking pardon day and night? He mentions his Islamic teachers by name. He is also perhaps asking their pardon for his forgetting of religious knowledge and for his conversion to Christianity. <clears throat> 
But this lament also carries the sense of asking God for both answer and forgiveness for the hardships of his enslaved existence. In this text, Kaba is already an old man, thinking of and welcoming death. He is a Moravian, but still a Muslim in essence. I contend that in no way can Kaba be judged for his conversion by any Islamic religious standard that does not allow for the horror of chattel slavery. He certainly did far more to preserve his Islamic heritage than most could. Back to his manuscript, Kaba corresponded by letter with another enslaved Jamaican Muslim in whom magistrate R.R. R. Madden, an abolitionist Irish magistrate in Jamaica with a fascination for Muslim Africans took a great interest and whose freedom Madden helped secure. This second enslaved Jamaican Muslim was named Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, alias Edward Donnellan, originally from Timbuktu, Mali. Magistrate Madden, recorded Kaba's and Abu Bakr's letters to each other, claiming that both men's conversions were diffident and suspect. Quoting Madden, Kaba first writes a letter in Arabic to Donalan and states that the purpose of the letter is to convert Donalan from Mohammedanism to the Christian faith. Muhammad, uh, sorry, Madden, no fool, then, ex then exclaims, quote, but what is my surprise at finding the letter of the old man who is so anxious to convert his countrymen from the Muslim creed, commencing in these terms, in the name of God, merciful and omnipotent, the blessing of God, the peace of his prophet Muhammad. So much for the old African's renunciation of Islam. Baden correctly identified there, as we just mentioned, the Basmala, Bismillah, Hir Rahman Rahim, in the name of God, most gracious and merciful, which begins each surah or chapter of the Quran except one. You can see it again in Kaaba's text on the upper right here. In the same letters, Abu Bakr asks to be sent a copy of the Quran, even though he claimed to be interested in Christian conversion. Abu Bakr eventually also wrote his own brief autobiography and returned to Africa a free man. I'll now turn briefly to Afro-Caribbean Muslim literature and its Sufi influences in the 20th century. Again, I'm invested in identifying the genealogy of Black Muslim Caribbean literature and its Sufi influences, even with interruption. Just because enslaved African Muslims left no direct descendants who were practicing Muslims does not mean their writings and tradition of West African Sufi literacy can't be linked to those of their genealogical, spiritual, or political descendants today. Abdurrahman Slade Hopkinson, born in 1934 in New Amsterdam, British Guyana, was a Caribbean poet of the Brathwaite, Walcott, independence and post-colonial generation, a Muslim convert, and a father of award-winning speculative fiction writer Nalo Hopkinson, whom some of you may know. His work is far less well-known and studied than most of his counterparts. The reason for his lack of recognition are numerous, he did not publish prolifically, and he suffered from serious kidney disease for the last decades of his life. In addition, Guyanese poets hailing from a unique South American post-colonial space receive less recognition in the Anglophone Caribbean than island poets. And in Guyana itself, Hopkinson has been overshadowed by one of his national contemporaries, the Guyanese poet of anti-colonialism, Martin Carter. I argue in the book though, that he is the very poet laureate of the Muslim Caribbean. Hopkinson first published a book of poetry, The Four and Other Poems in 1954, followed by a series of plays and two other poetry collections published by the Guyana Ministry of Education and Social Development. The volume Snowscape with Signature collects by People Tree Press collects many of his poems from 15, sorry, 1952 to 1992 and was published in 1993 shortly after his death, though he chose the poems therein. Hopkinson's religious Muslim poems in the text include Ahad, Dhikr, Soul, Neither Fog Nor Flight, and Azan, which invoke the mystic, uh, sorry, medieval Sufi mystics and teachers from the medieval era to the 18th century. I'll discuss one of those poems a bit more shortly. <clears throat> 
The Jamaican poet and critic Mervyn Morris writes in his introduction to Hopkinson's Snowscape with Signature collection that Hopkinson's religious poems are perhaps his most, most distinctive contribution to West Indian poetry. Hopkinson's work is usually briefly listed in histories of Caribbean poetry as displaying a formal educated thoughtfulness and stylistic discipline similar to his more famous contemporaries, including Edward Kamal Brathwaite, Mervyn Morris himself, and Eric Walcott. Such listings generally conclude with a brief word about his religion and religious poetry in the vein of his entry in Edward Baugh's A History of Literature in the Caribbean, which reads, quote, Hopkinson became a convert to Islam, and the poems that come out of this development are distinguished by a near mystical sweetness and light and provide yet another current in the stream of Caribbean poetry. To put it plainly, Caribbean literary critics do not know what to do with Hopkinson's religious poetry, as it engages with a religious current, Islam, that seems foreign to the Caribbean and its majority Christian and African syncretic religions. So the critics defer analysis and speak of the mystical sweetness of light in Hopkinson's Muslim poems. Whereas I argue that many of the poems with Islamic themes are both visceral and emotionally wrenching and are distinct from his poems about Caribbean post-colonial identity and landscape. Hopkinson converted to Islam in 1964. He was explicit about his engagement with the most famous Sufi poets, including Omar Khayyam, Fariduddin Attar, and Jalaluddin Rumi, occasionally naming them in his poems. Hopkinson, the poet, was concerned with the contradictions of faith and the binary struggles of Sufism between material, materiality and spirituality, between ego and soul, between divine and profane, and between ecstasy and suffering. He sought batim, the hidden real truth behind what words seem to say. In Hopkinson's religious poetry, he entertains Sufi teachings that su suggest those binary oppositions ought instead to be reframed as having the same root and source in the divine realm where truth lies. The poems never quite come to a spiritual or material resolution or peace, the state of being both seeker and observer in transit to unity with the divine is paramount. Hopkinson said in 1977 that his terminal illness had given him a consciousness of death with which he was living quite comfortably and beyond terror. Writing poems had become for him primarily an act of spiritual clarification. Here's a brief poem, Soul, in which Hopkinson's Sufi poetic influences and techniques are clear. I'll read it briefly. Ego must die so that the soul may be born, but ego is identical with the soul. Beloved, resolve in me Ad Darkawi's mystery. You built it into the soul's architecture. On first glance, we already see the typical Sufi poetic invocation of the beloved, who may or may not be God. But the poem is also a reflection on the teachings of a more recent North African Sufi master, not the ones I've mentioned, who also influenced Hopkinson. The ad mentioned in the poem is Moroccan, Sheikh Malay al-Arabi al darqawi founder of the Darqawiya Tariqa, or Brotherhood, of the Shadili Sufi order. He died in 1823. In the Sheikh's writings, his mystery is that of the soul and batin, that which is hidden. The Sufi and Islamic theological conflict between the hidden ruh, the immortal soul self, and the nafs, the ego, psyche, or seat of worldly desires. These, struggle, these forces exist together in the living person, and the jihad of life is the struggle between them and the fight to keep, to keep the nafs, the ego, in check. In this and others of Hopkinson's poems, the beloved is always God, who is called upon to help the speaker rec reconcile the conflict between ego and soul, as in fact the resolution, as he says here, is inbuilt by God into the soul's architecture. To summarize, Kaba and Abu Bakr, as African men educated in Sufi traditions who had then been enslaved for most of their adult lives in Jamaica, also faced their mortality, made offerings of their words, and sought spiritual clarification in their writings. The Guyanese Hopkinson's contemporary poetry and engagement with Sufism provides a migratory continuity of Afro-Caribbean literary Islam 
that reaches across a century and a half to assure Kaaba and Abu Bakr that though they were unable to practice their religion, Islam remains a religion of the Caribbean. I'll end there, thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Khan. Uh, now we will have a response by Professor Wendell Marsh. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this um, talk by Professor Khan. Um, she has uh, gracefully brought together a very broad history of um, Islam in the Atlantic world, um, but also looked beyond uh, what is often thought of as kind of the, the documentary traces of uh, the past and really thought about these traces as texts um, to be interpreted. And so I really enjoyed these close readings that she offered that uh, in my mind establishes uh, what she calls a lineage of um, Afro-Caribbean literature uh, starting from um, uh, Muhammad Kaba uh, Senganugu, um, but also Abu Bakr Sadiq to um, Abdurrahman Slade Hopkinson, which I, I was now aware that uh, he's the father of Nalo Hopkinson, uh, the kind of of uh, the author of speculative fiction, who's a uh, really fantastic author. So um, I'm actually trying to contain my excitement. Uh, at this uh, talk, there's so much to uh, engage with, but uh, for the sake of uh, encouraging the conversation as opposed to monopolizing it, I want to focus on um, one uh, element of your talk that I think would be really fruitful for our group being uh, the Islam, the humanities and the human. So, um, you, uh, in the first two figures that you deal with, uh, Muhammad Kaaba uh, and Abu Bakr Sadiq, um, are not unknown figures, right? They're actually quite well known to uh, scholars, right? And their texts have been mined for data about uh, Muslim histories in the Americas, right? Um, and yet you revisit these texts that are well known and do something I haven't seen done with these texts before. You say that these are literary works, right? That warrant interpretation, that actually, if we think about policy meaning, right? How in poetry, we're not just um, trying to translate a one-to-one -one meaning, but actually trying to appreciate the range of meanings that one word can hold, right? How sound and sense are brought together into one lexical uh, object to, to, to do work and to, and to um, stir feeling, right? Invoke feeling. Um, and so, uh, I was wondering if you could reflect on um, what you're able to see and do with these texts uh, that the established literature really hasn't been able to do. And then how might that, uh, uh, this approach that you're taking, which one that insists on the necessity of interpretation uh, impacts the narrative. Um, this is, this is, kind of one point that I would like for us to go into. This, the second point I just want to highlight is uh, the comment you made about how the British uh, try to equate race and religion and how this was really a form of racecraft mm -hmm. that uh, prevented creolization, right? Um, I, I'm curious about uh, the kind of contemporary cultural dynamics in the Caribbean, where you see that going, but also what uh, possibilities do uh, we see around the uh, creolization happening around the festivals of Jose and Taja um, in the Caribbean? Um, um, right, so how can, we, how can we use that to think about other possibilities that aren't simply um, uh, complicit in uh, imperial uh, racecraft. There's so much more to engage with in your talk, but I think if we take on these two questions, that can really start a conversation that um, everyone else can also uh, participate in. Thank you so much for this talk. 
Thank you so much, Wendell, for that really detailed engagement. I will start with the first question that you raised about the literariness of the text and what that might offer. Um, so I am a I am a trained I am a literary scholar, right? I'm trained in literary analysis, and you know you're right in saying that this these texts have been worked on by historians, um, and you know treated as these kind of ge genealogical um, historiographic texts, but not necessarily interpreted literarily. Um, it's also it was also too import, for, important for me to read them from read them Islamically. Um, in addition to, to literarily, but like really pay attention to what they were doing religiously. But I'll, I'll say in an overarching kind of way first that for me, um, fiction and autobiographies like this and these kinds of like documents that are hard to quantify and qualify are what's fill the gaps in the archives. You know, like we don't have the story. We can't say that we, we can't point to, you know, the, the, the British recording, as I said, names and stories and origins and so on of the African Muslims that they enslaved or American, US Americans doing the same. But, you know, here we have these texts that are people writing about themselves, writing in their own hand. Um, and, and then later on, we have like Abdur Rahman Slade Hopkinson's poetry that attempts to, you know, revisit that connection. Um, yeah, so for me, those texts fill the gaps in the archives, right? They, even though, you know, they are imaginings in some kind of way, they are speculative in other kinds of ways, um, but they nonetheless do the job. I really get, in, I really um, am continually inspired by Audre Lorde's formulation of biomythography, um, in which she, she, she suggests that one might tell the story of, an, of a community by, by visiting the literature and oral histories of individuals, right? You can tell your community's own history by looking at, you can tell the story of your community's own history if it hasn't been recorded officially or in you know the dominant narrative by telling individual stories. So that is something I draw a lot of um, inspiration from. Um, and that is, I think, what it can do for us disciplinarily. In terms of um, approaching the text religiously and also to you know what else it was it was not just religiously but it's also like, like scholar to scholar um these men were scholars in the same way that we were and it is clear from you know the the length of their citation list <laughs> and like the depth of their citations and their knowledge that is on display in you know in numerous of these texts both the ones in the us and in the caribbean I had I found myself like having this really strange reaction when reading them as a scholar, you know, like inclined in the like that was similar to the reactions that people in the US public and the Caribbean public had, um, and the European public, British public had when reading their works at the time. They felt sorry for them because they're educated. And I felt connected to them because, you know, I'm educated, I'm a scholar, and you find yourself thinking things like, man, you know, they probably suffered more because they're educated um, and because, you know, they have fallen far, you know, from being imams, scholars, like authorities in their religious and cultural communities to enslaved on a plantation, you know, cutting cane. But that's not true and that's not fair, you know, like, so, like you know, to say that they suffered more for this kind of reason. But you, I, found, I found myself and having to question the sympathy I felt for, uh, toward them, that is the same sympathy that people of their time felt toward them as educated. So that's complicated. In terms of Islamically, um, I, I am a Muslim and so it was, and, and so I recognize the formulations that they use as ones that I myself learned how to use as a child when praying, right? And I think um, that is an important thing and, and it is not something that you would necessarily catch if you weren't coming from those traditions themselves, but it's moving, right? Um, and it's identifiable to see them um, not just uh, Kaaba, but also the the um, Bilali Muhammad document in the United States and, and some of the other ones. These formulations, the, the dua, invocation, prayer formulations are very much the same as the ones Muslims learn now. You know, all, so many of these texts start off with Bismillah, right? Um, and 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 in and invoking the name of the God, name of God, name name of the Prophet, and that kind of thing. But then the literary 
and oral formulations of how to ask for help are the same ones that Muslims would recognize today, right? In the name of God, I ask for forgiveness for, you know, forgetting the Quran, forgetting your words, and I ask for, and I ask, you know, I beseech you for help. Um, you know, sometimes they quote passages from the Quran and things like that. So it's moving in that kind of way too. I mean, I, I really think, you know, one cannot just take a historical approach to these texts, but very much a multifaceted interdisciplinary histori historiographic approach to the text. And then you asked um, the, sec the second question about the equating of race to religion. I mean, that is, you know, we can start off by saying that that is certainly what happens in the, <laughs> that's what's happening in the United States right now, like since 9-11, right? Um, that Muslimness and it, oh no, I'm wrong. Like it, it, it changes is what I mean to say with 9/11. But from the from 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 the era that from the civil rights era and Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam is when Islam first becomes equated with blackness and revolutionary in, uh, revolutionary blackness in the United States. Then it shifts along 9/11 to be associated with generic brown people, regardless of where they might be from. So racialization is the name of the game for Islam in the U.S. One thing I wanted to point out is that this process is also at work in the Caribbean, but in different ways. That it starts with British colonization, and in the Anglophone Caribbean, as well as Suriname, it begins around this process. I'm sorry, this festival that I mentioned of Hussein or Muharram, um, when the British really understood the multi-ethnic participation in that religious festival and the multi-religious participation in that festival as a threat, as a threat to um, colonial hegemony, and you know, actively worked and violently worked to disrupt what seemed to be the first instance of Islamic syncretism and creolization in the Caribbean. Um, nowadays, as I mentioned, um, or, or rather beginning in the beginning in the late 19th century, Islam then, you know, or after the British fragmented, you know, any any opportunity for people to kind of come together in this way, um, Islam became associated with those descendants of Indian indentured laborers who were Muslim, you know, about 10, 6 to 10% of them, depending on where you're talking about. And that lasted into the 20th century, really until the 1990 coup in Trinidad um, by Abu Bakr and the Jamaat al-Muslimin, which is a majority black organization when suddenly people became aware that you know there were also black muslims in the caribbean um and now you know um there are certainly visible presences of people of both like indian and and african descent in the anglophone caribbean who are muslim but then there are also large numbers of people in places like puerto rico and brazil who are complicating the narrative through um conversion or reversion so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's becoming complicated. And one of the things I argue in the book is that um, the Caribbean discourse on Islam and the way in which ra Islam is racialized is now being interpreted through the lens of US 9-11 discourses. Um, you will find like all this rhetoric on terrorism that simply echoes what is happening in the United States um, without regard for the fact that the Caribbean has its own unique history with Islam. I'll give you one example of that and then I'll stop. Um, right after 9-11, uh, you know, when the world was trying to figure out who these Muslims are and, you know, what is terrorism and all this kind of stuff, um, what the Trinidadian government did was their reaction to 9-11 was to immediately go to um, Abu Bakr's Jamaat al-Muslimin compound and search it. Uh, even though Abu Bakr and the Muslimin had no connection whatsoever to 9-11 or to, you know, any, anybody associated with 9-11, they immediately ran to Abu Bakr and said that, well, he was a terrorist, he might know something about that even though his concerns were national and local Trinidadian ones. Mm -hmm. um, so right away, implicating the local in the global. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, I definitely want to continue this, this line of, of questioning, but I'm going to save it uh, to bring some other people in. Uh, first, let's hear from the uh, working group member, Sadia Abbas, and then there's a couple of questions in the q and I want to uh, get to as well. Oh, Maite is back. Okay. I'm sorry, everyone, my computer died and I'm now in Christina's office. <laughs> sorry. Okay. So, Sadia, your Sadia. mic is um, 
Oh, sorry. Um, thank you, Anya. That was beautiful. And, um, um, and I learned a lot. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to make a couple of comments, which you can elaborate on if you want to, but from the perspective of the working group, and because I think that there's that your contribution is, is, is both individually beautiful, but also in the way that it contributes to what we're trying to do, right? Um, it's interesting because of course, it also echoes something that was being said um, last time by R.A. Judy, who pointed out that for instance, Ben Ali, uh, uh, which is how I know him, uh, right? Because of even disforming the American canon that actually reads the text as both an Islamic and a literary document is, um, um, it has been taken as a specimen rather than, than a, a somebody worth reading, right? And of course, that's partly what you're performing and, and, and that you're doing the work as well, right? And, and, and it's, to me, kind of incredibly powerful. And then, so, so what that speaks to then are issues about legibility and method, it seems to me. Right. So on the one hand, there's the question of the legibility of the archive, which becomes a question of the invisibility. Right. That the, we may not be, and now I'm going to speak a little bit as a Muslim as well, we may not be legible, therefore we're not visible. Right. And then, and that means so, so, the, so uh, to some extent, um, um, you know, and, and that's why I was insistent that we needed colonial Atlantic in our, in our, um, um, you know, sort of inaugural theme as well, precisely because the colonial kind of allows us to think about um, a lot of the things you're talking about, right? For instance, the fact that this is happening in the 1800s and there's a, what you're calling the Thaja uh, procession, which in, in South Asia is called the Thazia mm -hmm. procession, right? Which the Indians would, uh, the British would have known from the fact that the Shia population was so absolutely central to power in 19, in, in, you know, in Lucknow and in North India, right? And a lot of the kind of colonial codes were coming out of navigating the relationships with those populations, right? Mm -hmm. So how would it be that even as South Asians migrated, they would not carry that with them, right? So the interruption of creolization that you bring about, right? And that's absolutely brilliant, right? racecraft as interruption of possibilities of sociality, right? And I think we really need to work with that as a working group. Like we need to develop that, right? Then the question becomes the methodological challenge to the humanities, which also comes from the question of legibility, right? The, the fact is that these archives are hidden in plain sight. Mm -hmm. So why have we not engaged them up till now, right? And that's actually the challenge, right? I and mean, the challenge is actually a critique of us as scholars, right? And now I speak for, as, as a member of the American Academy or the Anglophone Academy, right? It's right there. I mean, of course, I can read the Bismillah, but, in, in, you know, because I, I don't understand Arabic, but I was taught as a good Pakistani child to read Arabic <laughs> without understanding a word, right? But the bigger issue is the question of, of method. If we take seriously, the histories that people like Wendell are putting out, that Ari Judy have put out, that you have put out, that Michael Gomez has put out, right? That Maite is working on, right? I mean, that if we take these histories seriously, then we have to reimagine the humanities and in this case, literary scholarship, because you and I are literary scholars from the ground out, right? And here, and I'm gonna do something incredibly reactionary, I'm gonna quote T.S. Eliot, right? When he, Eliot talks about tradition and the individual talent challenge, he actually says that each new edition makes us reorient the whole, right? So the question then becomes, what does happens when you come along with this and you're gonna reread Caribbean poetry in this way through Slade Hop Hopkinson was it, right? Because what you're then saying is, what does it mean if we rethink the entire canon from this moment, right? And so in that sense, reading Islamically becomes interesting, of course, because reading poetically, means attending to all the genealogies and we attending to all the historicity of something. We've been doing that. I'm an early modernist as well, and I read Christian poetry. We do that anyway. I mean, there was a challenge in the 70s and 80s, or the 80s rather, to rethink Christian poetry and to take the Christian content seriously, right? Milton's not just an epic poet. He's also a particular kind of Protestant, right? That is going to inflect the formal issue too. So, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that, right, um, all of those things that you're bringing together here, 
are a challenge for us, but also a gift to us, right? Um, to reimagine method, right? In some kind of way that is archivally um, holistic, right? And I'm, I'm not going new age here, but 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 but, but that, that actually need needs to make us rethink the parts in order to think the whole more capaciously with a kind of greater, I think, methodological intelligence in some sense. So you can respond to that and, or, you know, and, and I don't want to take more time, but I do want to say that, you know, this is, as we go forward, this is something that we have to think about very deeply. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for your points. I'll respond to a couple of them in a kind of, maybe a, maybe what ends up being a little bit of a roundabout way. But um, I think, first of all, I want to say that your own work provides a model for contesting the dominance of the secular in post-colonialism, right? And contesting the, the removal of Islam as a metric by which to, you know, think about post-colonial literature. So that said, yes, I think we should be rethinking the canon all the time. Um, or, you know, making new canons or breaking canons or, 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 or so forth. So forth. Um, I think methodologically, my method is always interdisciplinary and all of our methodologies should be interdisciplinary. I don't see how in this historiographic work that also involves literary readings and, and filling gaps in archives, I don't see how it could be anything besides interdisciplinary. Um, I was also, I've also thought a lot about how interdisciplinary, what the relationship between interdisciplinary and your personal locus of enunciation, you know, as we would have it as a scholar is, which I think you have to be really clear about. Um, in, for example, in my book, I use my own family's history, right? The, the cover photo, um, I don't have it here, but the cover photo is a photo that has my mother and my aunt um, as children and my grandmother in it. Um, there's also photos of like my great grandfather, his Hajj photo, uh, fo a photo of my grandfather. And all of these things are things I wouldn't have had access to if I were not their grand, you know, their granddaughter and so on. Um, but once again, I am really drawing from Audrey or Audrey Lords. You know, she's a Caribbean American too, like me. Um, her, her biomythography that, you know, gave me permission. It's also too that like people like Saidia Hartman's work too, um, you know, her work on this kind of speculative criticism. It, I, I needed people to give me permission to say that it's okay to talk about my family when like, you know, I, it's their story that I'm telling and the story of my people and my community and so on. But there was something there where I needed people to go before me like Audre Lorde to give me permission to talk in that kind of way and to make like investigating your own family archive a part of academic methodology. Uh, I think, you know, people do it all the time, but we kind of slide, you know, elide that it is personal in that, in, in that way. So that's part of the interdisciplinarity for me. Um, I don't think we should shy away from saying that. In terms of legibility and um, thinking about the legible in the context of Muslim and Islamic studies, it is really important, right? Because, if, you know, um, what 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 is the, what is a famous story that that like Muslims learn right? The first thing that the you know when, when the angel Gabriel um, you know starts relaying the the Quran to Muhammad, the first thing that is said is Iqra, read. Um, so when that is the first thing that needs that needs to be said in you know conveying the Quran to Muhammad and to the world. Um, what is legible becomes something really important because then much is made of the fact that Muhammad himself may be illiterate. Um, but yet the Quran is this really serious literary document, but nonetheless one that has this also very serious oral tradition. Um, and in what, what the text that I'm studying offers is that it is a text of memory as well as something that's orally heard and transmitted because these men are writing fragments from the Quran that they have not heard in 20, 30, 40 years. How does memory work when transmitting, um, you know, things that you learn about Islam, including the Quran itself, 30, 40, 50 years down the line um, in the new world? So I'm interested in that. I'm also interested thinking about um, legibility, it, um, like in, in a really literal sense, um, in talismans. So um, we know that uh, 
And like, how do we think of that in addition to these kinds of written texts? Um, things like talismans and amulets, which of course are a huge part of, this, of South Asian Islam, but also a huge part of African Islam. Islam too. We know that, um, you know, in the, the 19th century Malay rebellion in Brazil was the largest urban slave revolt in the Americas, but it was also spearheaded by Hausa, Yoruba, Nago people who were predominantly Muslim. And Islam was an organizing ideology for them, you know, to, 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 to combat the Portuguese. And one of the ways that they symbolize their Islam when they like, you know, went into battle, so to speak, is through these religious amulets, right, that contain fragments from the Quran, prayers, and so on. So, you know, I want to think about how we read those as artifacts, legible artifacts of Islam. Um, I was also fascinated to see that in Omar, so Omar Ibn Said, usually people just read his autobiography, right, the life of Omar Ibn Said, but he has all of these other like short little manuscripts, 14 of them, that are scattered in collections throughout the United States. And one of the short manuscripts um, in particular, and, and this appears more in the short manuscripts in general than it does in his autobiographical life of, um, he draws all these geometric designs that is really hard to tell what it is exactly that he's he's trying to do. Um, I think there there's a there's a, a diary, the Elizabeth Owen either Eliza Owen or Elizabeth Owen diary in a library in in Hanover, New Hampshire, is it? Um, anyway but I know it's the Elizabeth Owen diary, um, that he draws all these geometric patterns. And then he also has all these, he draws all these pentacles that look really Kabbalistic. And he puts his name in Arabic in the center of the pentacles. And so no one has ever tried to figure out what he's trying to do there, but it's also important to know that this kind of talisman and like talisman making symbol and, and then like symbol, it's creating of symbols, was important for African Muslim, from for African Islam of the era. So I really like to see somebody try to read his drawings and his like mystical symbolism in addition to the text. I don't know if I feel equipped to do it, but someone should. I love that that last part, um, Alia. Um, so we're going to go to a question. One of the questions in the chat box, um, and then um, Alex, of course, you'll have. Uh, uh, time to ask your question, but there is one question from y Yusuf Carter. I wonder about Muhammad Kaaba's use of the term science and its apparent loss in his writing. I wonder what word was used here. Makes me think of the notion of religious sciences or aim, um, or loom, uh, and further the manner in which the sawuf and certain inward knowledges can be described as sciences. Are you able to expound a bit on uh, on this? Yes, I think. Um, thank you for that for that um, question, Ms. Carter. Um, I think you're right in saying that he means the Islamic sciences in a traditional uh, in the traditional sense of the Islamic sciences, which aren't just necessarily about hard science, right? They're not just about like what are the physics of the world and so on, but they include things like um, medicine and medical knowledge, but it also includes things about the spirit, the soul, how to heal that. Um, it also involves uh, moral and ethical and religious rules and all, all of the above, like these things, ethics, what I'm trying to say, ethics are also sciences. Um, so I think, yes, the Islamic sciences um, is more expansive than just um, science um, for, for Kaaba. Great. Um, Alex, would you like to um, ask your question? Sure, thank you, Aliyah, for this wonderful talk. Um, so many, I'm having so many great thoughts. So thank you for um, sparking those. Uh, so I just wanted to relate us back again to the theme of this year. Um, in particular, I come, you know, you, you mentioned that you strove to be interdisciplinary in your work, and that's definitely clear. And so as the uh, art historian representative today, I just wanted to ask about the materiality of some of these sources, if you could just talk a little bit about that. Um, and that I, there's also a question in the chat that says, could you share your sources with us, particularly the Jamaican Islamic text by Muhammad Kaba? So you had sort of a, a black and white photograph of that, but 
if you could just talk, um, you were mentioning the, the pictures and the diagrams and the Omar Ibn Said um, manuscripts, but if you could just sort of like a nerdy art historical question, tell us like, what is it like to handle these? What are, what's the paper like? What's the ink like? Um, when you mentioned that the, that the, um, the Quran, Thomas Jefferson's Quran traveled, but not the manuscript paid, these are the Omar Ibn Said. I was also, I mean, obviously, yeah. there's, there's like a political aspect to that, but also maybe just sort of conservation, like how delicate are these? So just to talk a little bit about the materiality, what they're like today and what they might have originally been like um, to add that, that um, interdisciplinary tact to um, yeah. courses, yeah. That's a really interesting question. And yeah, I saw Belinda Edmondson's um, question about where the Kaaba text is from. So you can go, you two can go see the Kaaba text. It's at the University of Oxford um, archives. It's preserved in the James Coulthard papers, which are a set of Baptist missionary papers from Jamaica from the 1800s. Um, and a lot of these texts were preserved, or, or, or some of these texts, right? Let me say that. Some of these texts, particularly the ones in the Caribbean, were preserved by Baptist missionaries and Christian missionaries, right? Which is, you know, kind of an interesting Christian missionaries who took an interest in something that was also religious, not Christian, but then all, but also that means they identified it as religious in some ways and worth preserving. So yeah, you can go and see, you can go and see Kaba's manuscript at the University of Oxford. Um, so in most cases, they're, they're very, they're, you know, crude's not the right word, but like they, they don't have access to a like nice paper. Uh, so the paper itself tends to be like really, really kind of like coarse stuff that you might use for like wrapping. The binding is, is, is usually sewn, um, you know, by hand in uh, like as well as people can manage. Uh, the binding is also usually like, ca like cow leather, um, as, as you could probably maybe see a bit from some of those, some of those, um, some of those images. Um, the ink is, you know, standard India ink for the most part, but yeah, it's just, it just has the, the feel overall of these kind of browned and yellow texts. Um, the Baptist missionaries didn't necessarily, you know, use anything close to contemporary artistic preservation methods to handle them. So, you know, they are what they are. They're not, they're not deteriorating to the extent that you might think because, you know, the, but they're still objects, right, that will experience deterioration without further preservation. And they're not particularly being preserved in any concerted way. Like you'll find, you'll find them in a box with like missionary papers in these British British library collections, you know, and of course the British were the nation of shopkeepers who kept records of every single thing on earth. So they literally have boxes upon boxes and like thousands of boxes of colonial archival materials scattered around the UK. Um, so you'll find them in boxes like that. I, there's another question, uh, anonymous question, but I wanted to say that as an early modernist and as a specialist on Moriscos, I was very, very happy to see you mention uh, the Moriscos in your talk. And I was actually thinking, uh, because last week I participated in, in a, a conference that we organized here at Rutgers on race in the pre-modern world, that it would be very nice to engage with the uh, more recent scholarship uh, coming out on uh, racecraft and, and uh, racialization of uh, slaves uh, in the early modern period, I mean, uh, 16th, uh, 17th century. So I think that'll be really exciting, a really exciting conversation between that scholarship and your work. So I was, I was super happy to, to, uh, to hear about the Moriscos. There is an anonymous uh, question, uh, great talk. Lots to chew on here. Love the Audre Lorde and Saidia Hartman connections. Could you elaborate on the racialization of Caribbean Islam and Indo-Caribbean and therefore not Creole or so the formulation goes by the colonial authorities who saw the multiracial celebration of Jose as a threat? Aren't contemporary Muslimin beliefs still seen as in line with black nationalism and therefore part of the lineage of anti-colonial creolization? No. So isn't Caribbean, um, 
Islamism further racialized in the contemporary moment as Black Creole versus Asian non-Creole, even as Islam becomes more widespread in the region? Thank you for that series of questions. So the answer to that's, you know, yes and no. Um, it is true that Islam begins by certainly being racialized in the car in the Anglophone Caribbean and Suriname, to be specific, as um, something that is the religion of Indian indentured laborers. And as Sadia pointed out, like it is those customs are not things that the British were unfamiliar with. I want to, I want to, I want to echo that too. Um, they knew exactly what they were and what was going on. That's clear from colonial colonial records, many of them had also been various kinds of governors and so on in India, you know, career British bureaucrats who went from one part of the empire to another. So knew what they were seeing. Um, but it is true too that, you know, black people participating in, in the celebrations were a new thing. Um, in terms of the way that it happens contemporarily where, or, or you know, in the 20th century where the Jamaat al-Muslimin was equated with black nationalism, that's true too. But what I want to say is that they are not the, they are no longer the sole representatives of black Muslims in the Caribbean. Um, they and their roots in that kind of black nationalism are no longer the sole representative of black Muslims in the Caribbean at all. Most black Muslims in the Caribbean now have more associations with mainstream Sunni Islam than anything else and are influenced more by, um, you know, um, uh, Egypt, by, by traveling to and studying in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and also missionaries and Qurans coming from those places than they are influenced by anything else, including um, African Islam. So, and that's true too of the Indian population. So they're getting the same foreign Arab influences. Um, both, both ethnic communities are kind of getting the same foreign Arab influences. Uh, let me see, in terms of uh, the the other the other points the the person was asking um, I think yeah I, yeah I just want to say that most most people are people are different now their influences come from very different places oh yeah I remember what I want to say um, another way in which I guess you could say Islam is perceived or or you know seems to be more multiracial now in the Anglophone Caribbean is that in the last few years it has not escaped um, observation in Trinidad and in Jamaica in particular and also too it has not escaped the attention of U.S. intelligence that several hundred Muslims from the Caribbean went to fight for in the Islamic State in Syria and Lebanon, right? So that's something that US was, was very concerned about and suddenly noticed after a while that there were Muslims in the Caribbean and like there's all the stuff from the Secretary of State about what to do about that and how weird it is and so on. Um, but what's interesting to note is that the people who went um, to fight for the Islamic State, primarily from Trinidad and from Jamaica, demographically speaking, they were both black and people of Indian descent. And they interestingly um, were demographically a little different too from the majority of people who went to the Islamic State from elsewhere, their families. So people tend, as opposed to like single young men or single young women, people tended to go and bring their husband, wife and kids with them. So that's another way in which um, I think the racialization of Muslims in the Caribbean has gone far beyond the um, uh, the, the, the the thinking about them as just Indian or thinking about the Jamaat al-Muslimin as a representative of Black Muslims in the Caribbean. There's much more going on now. Wendell, did you want to um, ask a question? Well, I, well I, I see this comment by our colleague Zain Abdullah, which I think is a really important one. He's kind of elaborating on um, the whole question about um, the geometric figures and the manuscripts um, he's worked on some of this. I think Yusuf Carter also mentioned that in Bailo yeah, and Bailo. Well, I know his work. Uh, yeah, are, are working on, on that. Um, I, I just wanted to go back to the Muhammad Kaaba text, um, which really, um, I, I've read it before, but something about uh, seeing it in the context of your presentation made me kind of see two things. Really the first line, right, where he um, refers to the uh, Jamaat al-Muslimin Muslimat. Um, so the kind of directly addressing uh, both uh, males, Muslim males who are visible in the archive and uh, Muslim women um, yeah. who are, are, are not. And I wanna connect this to uh, 
you mentioned Hartman and uh, the kind of work of critical fabulation and the importance of a speculative criticism in um, addressing the gaps and the lacunae in the archive. Um, so there is a, so usually when we think about the archive, it's um, enslaved African men who are, are visible. There are many historical justifications that explain this, right? That um, there were more men who uh, were taken across the Middle Passage um, than women. Um, I think it's the, the figure is that, um, you know, two thirds uh, were male, one third women. And so i uh, just proportionally speaking that uh, there are more Enslaved, Af enslaved Africans who are men than women, right? This is the kind of uh, uh, demographic explanation. Um, but, and there's an example that we have of an enslaved African woman uh, by the name of Majig and Jai, who's uh, very similar to Ayuba Sulimanjalo and kind of these other, other figures who come from the Senegambia. Now, what strike, strikes me as so interesting is that when we talk about Majig and Njai, also known as Anna Kingsley, mm -hmm. who is in the kind of Florida colonies, uh, I believe in the 18th century, who eventually uh, runs uh, she's kind of the concubine of the slave owner and comes to kind of manage the plantation herself um, under kind of the Spanish colonial order. Um, you know, she's coming from a, a deeply Muslim context. Mm -hmm. And yet uh, she isn't remembered as being Muslim. And in these narratives, when we're retracing uh, the, the lineages of Islam in America, uh, mm -hmm. I haven't really seen her invoked as being a part of that lineage. Uh, and so she's occluded in many ways. And so reading the Muhammad Kaaba uh, in this context and thinking about what is manifest and what is hidden, and also trying to think about a method that could help us work through some of this. Uh, the, the case of Majig and Jai and a Kingsley is, is someone who I think uh, is, is who we should think about. Um, and you know, we should uh, critically fabulate of, of what would this kind of uh, lineage of Islam uh, of enslaved Muslim women uh, also look like. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a really interesting point, and I really like that as an approach to trying to figure out what's happening with Muslim women in the Americas. And, you know, like in the case of um, in the, in the case of Anna Kingsley, who of course is how we all know her as, like she's not even usually talked about as being Muslim or um, related to Islam in any any way, right? It's always the story of like how you know she rose from her enslavement in Cuba to acquire power. Mm -hmm and acquire her own properties mm -hmm. um, like that's that's the story but I really like yeah that is a, that that would that would that would be so that would be so beautifully done right to, to think about like Kaba's invocation of the, the male and female members of the community thinking that maybe he's addressing the entire Uma right which consists of both which certainly for him consists of both men and women regardless of if he's talking to the Uma in the new world or the Uma uh, in the whole world uh, I really like that thank you we have one uh, more question that we can uh, take uh, in the Q&A from Alfred Ranger. Good afternoon. I wish you had time to elaborate on the history or lack thereof or of mixed Husay celebrations, but time is short. However, as an older Guyanese who was a teenager in the 70s and who experienced the 90s Trinidad Revolution uprising far, uh, from far away, New York, my question, can you elaborate a little on your conversation with Abu Bakr, your scholarly and gut impressions, his influence on the general Islamic community in Trinidad? Um, so thank you so much, Mr. Granger, for coming. I know I have known Mr. Granger since I was a child um, in, in Guyana, but um, I really appreciate you coming. So this is a really interesting question about my conversation with Abu Bakr, or a couple of conversations with, with, with and interviews with Abu Bakr. Um, you know, what struck me the most about this man who has been, you know, depending on who you talk to, villainized or lionized as the Caribbean's number one terrorist, is that Muslim terrorists, 
is that he was really funny. Like the guy was just like a post-colonial jokester via Naipaul level, um, like post-colonial satirist and jokester. You know, he could turn a phrase really well. He was really hilarious. And he loved the fact that he was, you know, people call him one of the Calypso kings of Trinidad because it's interested to note that when he took over uh, parliament, right, because this armed coup uh, succeeded in taking over parliament and holding the members of parliament, including the prime minister hostage, um, as well as taking over Trinidad's uh, radio and television stations at the time, um, national radio and television station, one of the first thing he did was play his favorite Calypsos on national radio nonstop. This is not something that you would necessarily associate with a Muslim revolutionary. Again, one of the things I argue in the book is that Muslim Caribbean people have a really particular relationship to the theology of and permissibility of music um, in Islam. But so he really loved that. And, you know, he was a very personable character, um, but also very sharp. I really, uh, uh, he knew, you know, he had, he was years past his prime and engagement with, um, you know, the political Islamic world and his like nefarious dealings with Libya and all of this Cold War dealings. Um, but he was really on top of exactly what was happening in the Muslim world with Islam in any place and any time. He knew what was happening in Syria, what was happening in Lebanon, what was happening in the U.S. Important to note, he was also on the US, on the North American no-fly list. Um, he knew everything that was going on and his analysis were very much um, on point and precise um, about like, you know, why it is that, you know, he, he of course disavowed any kind of relationship to any kind of terrorist activity that was happening in the entire world at that time. Um, but he was very much on point about why it is, you know, when asked this question of like, why do you think young men, you know, engage in these kinds of activities or become radicalized or whatever, he knew exactly why he was like well you know there are all these wars going on in the middle east and this is american imperialism and so on so even though we associate him now as being tied to this local compound in trinidad and he can't even travel outside he could not even travel outside of it as i said he passed away a couple of days ago um he was very much on point um, in terms of what's happening in the world his son fuad abu Bakr, is now a politician in trinidad and you know like now everybody's waiting to see what he's what what kind of um, how much he's going to engage with the legacy of his father. Um, another weird thing about Abu Bakr is like the man also loved to be known as a ladies' man. It was gross, but it's true. Um, he had three wives, and you know it's it was he that and um, was the first time that Trinidadians also became aware that you know of of, of the fact that like you know. Muslims can have Muslim men can have uh, can be polygamous can have multiple wives and it was a it was a source of great like contention in a Trinidadian national discourse. He was very into that. But what I'm trying to say here um, that was a little off putting for me as an interviewer is that he was really flirtatious and he asked me to come and like hand deliver um, the book to him to his compound in Trinidad. Uh, you know, it, chances are actually I might have done it just to see what would happen. Um, but COVID intervened, and now he passed away. That's that that's that's the um, yeah that, that that's the ethnography story. Well, thank you so very much, uh, Professor Khan, for this wonderful, wonderful talk and for the wonderful conversation uh, that we've had. Wendell, I don't know if you want to uh, say a few words. We are very excited to have had you here today. And I hope that everyone um, continues to, to come to the lectures that our working group is organizing. Thank you very much to everyone.